Cool. So uh, we're going to be talking about the future in .NET MAUI. Ooh, there's a bot. Got to have the awesome bot. Uh, so I am David Ortnow. I am a principal product manager at Microsoft, and I work on the .NET team, specifically for MAUI. What? You can't laugh at that. Settled. Oh, you're laughing at the pictures. All right. That's, that's fine. You can laugh at the pictures. Um, Yes, so we had a little fun at .NET Conf last year. Uh, I've been with Microsoft now for going almost seven years. Um, before that, starting in about 1995, 96. Who was born before 95? All right, you're my people. Who was born after 95? All right, and then some people are just not raising their hands. When were you born? 85, yeah, you looked old. <clears throat> yeah, so I have been doing software since like 95, 96. Uh, I started out doing actually ASP VB script uh, with a little bit of access database because that was the powerhouse that's, that ran all the early internet websites, right? Um, and then I started doing these internet startups. And one of the first things that I did with an internet startup was I flew from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Where is she? She left the room. There was, there's somebody here from Tulsa. Uh, flew from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Moscow, Russia with a Toshiba laptop about that thick and a uh, phone line. And I broadcast a live event with 20,000 people from a big Red Army facility. It was a non-Red Army event. <laughs> um, and uh, we had to work our phone line into the Russian phone system because it was not the same connector. So this is the kind of madness that I have been involved in since my early days of technology, always trying to do something new and innovative. Um, and I love working on things that are creative, but also love working on developer needs and working on building things for you that can make your lives better, make your careers better, hopefully. Because I, for 15 plus years, had my own business. I was working as a consultant, sometimes with other people, but most times working for other startups or other companies. Like I built websites for Nike and for um, New Balance and things like that. Um, so I know what it means to be uh, at the forefront of your industry, making sure that your skills are what the market needs, uh, making sure that you're getting paid, right? You gotta get paid, because I don't know about your spouses or partners, but my wife doesn't like it when we don't have money. Right? Anybody in here like to be without money? Nobody, nobody. So, all right, that's enough about me. I was, I was kind of giving time for more people to filter in. Um, let's talk about .NET. Is anybody, I'm sorry, I'm a hand raiser. I ask a lot of questions because I want to know who I'm talking to and I don't want to tell you things that you're not interested in. How many here do not use .NET? All right, just a couple. All right, so you will be happy to know that .NET goes everywhere and anywhere. Uh, it certainly is a key part of why we build the product. We want to make it so that you can reuse your tech investments as a company, but also as developers, your skills, across a wide range of the targets that you need to reach. .NET MAUI specifically is targeted at the mobile and the desktop part, and especially cross-platform applications. So see, these are the applications that uh, you try to build once, you do as much of the UI in one place as possible, and you can run it on Android, iOS, Mac, and Windows. Yes, Mr. Ed, who I think is now out of the room, uh, we do not currently target Linux, but you can use Linux as your application uh, developer machine, uh, and you can target Android with it, so that is possible. How is .NET going? Is this a good place for you to be with your career? Are you, are you in the right spot? Well, 6.1 million active developers right now. 53,000 community members contributing to our open source GitHub repositories. We are completely open source. Uh, I think once you get into the tooling, some of the tools related things, maybe the build systems, certainly Visual Studio, sure, that's not open. But all of the SDKs, totally open. 
So we love contributors. We, we work hard to make contributing to our repos as easy and pleasant of an experience as possible. And it also means that when you have a need, we are here to listen and to figure out if we can collaborate with you on making that happen. So uh, you don't have to wait for Microsoft to announce anything. You can come to, to myself, to Maddie, to, to Gerald, who is on the engineering team, and say, we really need this. Here's the reasons we need this. Here's how much money we spend on Azure. You'll get that done for me, right? Right? Uh, and, and that's what we're there for. That's part of being open source. It doesn't mean everything's going to happen, but certainly is a lot. Uh, it's one of the most admired frameworks, highest velocity open source project in the top five, the whole .NET org is, and then a top five language on GitHub. C Sharp has become more and more popular as years go on. I've seen some recent market trend reports. C Sharp continues to go uh, up and increase, and some other languages like um, it rhymes with Java is slightly going down. So, you know, hey, we're doing all right. Uh, so you may ask, who's using this .NET MAUI thing? So .NET MAUI was announced May of 2020. We shipped it November of 2021. No, no, May of 2021. Uh, and then we shipped again .NET 7 in November. So we ship every year in November. Uh, we've now had two major releases, and we are working on the .NET 8 release, which will be our third major release. Uh, this takes over for Xamarin. Does anybody not know what Xamarin is? Please raise your hand. No, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not begging you to lie to me. All right, so everybody knows what Xamarin is. I'm going I'm to take that as a we know what it is. So, of course, this is the upgrade from Xamarin. Uh, of course, it is effort for many projects to make the transition to MAUI uh, or to .NET. And that's another thing that I should probably clarify for you who mostly here know what .NET is, know what Xamarin and MAUI are. Um, no, I forgot what I was going to say. That it's not. Oh, it's on .NET. Yes, 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 yes. I, I just totally blanked. I'll move on. Um, so what I wanted to get to with this slide is, you know, we often get asked now with this, oh, so you have Xamarin support for now. There's an overlap, but you need to get on Maui and get on .NET. That was the main thing that I was going to say about the transition. So Earth Solutions is a company that does uh, like field service applications, tablet, desktop, and mobile. They had a WPF application, and they had two Xamarin apps. And they wanted to combine all their technology with .NET MAUI. So they were an early adopter of .NET MAUI when we announced it. And they rewrote their WPF application for .NET MAUI UI. They were able to share all their view models and kind of their middle tier stuff, all their services, et cetera. Um, but then they rewrote their UI, and they were able to run that on Android, iOS, and Windows. So I've got a little video here that'll show you a little bit of the mobile experience. Um, so this is a rather long video. I won't necessarily make you watch all of it, but you can see it's a beautiful, modern application. They looked for implementing uh, very much of the fluent design style that Microsoft uses on our own products with Office and things like that, Outlook. You know, This probably starts to look like your Outlook, right? It's uh, very similar. Um, so they're using, uh, let's see, Esri, I believe, for all their mapping. Um, they do a lot of mapping, a lot of plotting on maps and things like that. Uh, they're online, offline, because they're in the field. They might be looking at a pipeline or some other, um, some other electrical thing or whatever, and they need to be able to take pictures of it, mark it on location, turn in service requests, service reports, and things like that, which we're seeing a lot of that. Let me skip forward. To a desktop. So then this is the tablet slash desktop experience. I might have skipped pack, past the picture part. There's a picture part, yeah. So they've got their own camera control in here. So it's a very rich, very well featured app. Um, they shipped it right around build time this past year. And so that's a really good case study. This is a good example just to show you here are the kinds of things that you can do with .NET MAUI. Um, when people ask, like they did in Maddie's session, is Maui production ready? I would absolutely say yes. Um, now, I also know from talking to a lot of developers, some developers have a higher tolerance for using open source, quickly moving software, and other developers expect something to be rock hard, 
I'll never find a bug ever, and it'll always do what I want it to do. Some customers have very demanding UIs and uh, applications. Others, uh, it's a very simple thing. So um, that answer on is it production ready, uh, there's a range there of, of how it's going to meet your needs. So understanding what your needs are and then looking at what the, what the framework current state is, I think is in your best interest. All right. So here are some other customers using .NET MAUI. Uh, you can see there are a couple of Microsoft logos on there, UPS, uh, Fidelity Investments. So we've got a lot of customers in government, in financial, um, in airlines. Um, many of the airlines you may be flying might use our technology on their applications, usually not the consumer applications, usually it's the business critical stuff. And I was actually saying this to somebody at lunch earlier, I don't know, in one of the conversations in the hallway, uh, that you know we didn't necessarily know just how important Xamarin was to customers until we decided to do .NET MAUI and have an end date for Xamarin. Because suddenly, companies that we'd never spoken to came out of the woodwork and said, hey, we do $9 million of business annually, and all of our tech is Xamarin. We have to move to Maui. Help, help, help. We can't not have this application. And that was one of just represents many, many stories. So when you're thinking about, is anybody using this thing? Is it really going to be around for a while, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, I, can, I can give you that answer. Tons of people, their whole business very you know, heavily depend upon this technology, and we're super glad about that. And these are just some of them on the screen here. And then as I mentioned, at Microsoft, we also have applications using .NET MAUI. So uh, Microsoft 365 Admin is for SharePoint. Microsoft Azure is for the Azure portal. And Store Commerce is a new application that supports something that Dynamics does. It involves a store, it involves commerce. I don't know. It's in a different area of the company. But some of these we only find out about because we go through the Google Store and we look for who's using .NET MAUI, and there's so many. So Microsoft absolutely is using .NET MAUI. Um, some information about MAUI and how it's going, uh, we are, among the top two and active GitHub users within the .NET org. So we're top two. Um, we're top two in the most active repos in the .NET Foundation. So of all the repositories in the .NET Foundation, we're number two in terms of users, pull requests, issues, discussions, et cetera. And then we are top five in the most active c -sharp repos on GitHub last month. We showed you, I showed you that .NET itself was the most active language, but uh, we are in the top five of most active repos last month on GitHub. So a lot of community activity, a lot of interest, a lot of usage, which I think is awesome. And then I wanted to show this graph here, which is the star history. Uh, the red is .NET Core, which I think you would agree is a very popular piece of .NET. And then .NET MAUI, our trajectory is awesome compared to that, but I noticed something when I looked this up. When I refreshed this based on current information, .NET MAUI has passed .NET Core. So this speaks a lot to the overall interest and activity on the, on the project, um, and we're really excited about that because in the long run, that's going to benefit all of us. And so if you haven't starred the repo, apparently you need to go do that. I don't know why you're not starring our repository. It's amazing. All right. So uh, as I mentioned, .NET 8 is coming up. So um, I'll pause here. Does anybody want to see a demo of, of just like file new? Here's what a MAUI app is, and here's what it looks like, and how the project is set up? Because it sounds like everybody kind of knows Xamarin and MAUI, so I'll skip that. Does that sound OK? If you want to see that later, come find me. I've got it on my machine and everything. Uh, I'll do that. All right, so here's some of the cool stuff coming for you in .NET 8. So first up, I want to tell you how you can preview .NET MAUI releases before they actually ship in Visual Studio. So one of the main feedback we got from .NET 6 and .NET 7 is, hey, uh, you're not shipping fast enough, or you've got a fix but I can't access, access that fix until you ship it. 
The other thing we realized was we were not really able to properly validate our releases with all the coverage that you would get from a preview, right? So with Xamarin Forms, we would ship preview, 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 then the stable release. And so we would have all that feedback from the previews from developers like yourselves, and we would be able to catch a regression or catch a bug that wasn't really fixed before it was a GA release. We have not had that with Maui, and we've really missed that in terms of our quality. Um, so we've brought that back. Now the Maui controls piece and the compatibility layer, which you probably don't need anymore, but it's there for some of the Xamarin Forms upgrade scenarios. Um, that is now a NuGet package, which you can access from NuGet.org. And we will begin publishing preview packages for upcoming releases. So at build, we'll ship .NET 8. That's pretty much done, although we just did RC 2.1 this week, Tuesday. RC 2.2 will go out next week. Pretty much between now and build, we have the opportunity, or not build, between now and .NET Conf in November, we have the ability to ship weekly. Um, because the previews of Visual Studio 17.8 are going out weekly, so we can do that. So once we get to November 14th and we ship GA, we are on the same day going to make available to you the very first service release, because we don't want to slow down our pace of shipping fixes and quality improvements to you. And so the way in which you're going to be able to do this is you're going to be able to upgrade to these things through Visual Studio. So this is both for service releases and for previews. Um, so just like managing any other uh, NuGet package, you use the NuGet package manager inside of Visual Studio. Uh, there is also one inside the going away Visual Studio for Mac. Um, Visual Studio for Code doesn't really seem to have a decent NuGet package manager, but you can do these things through uh, command line too. Um, you want to make sure you check the include pre-release button. And then what's going to happen is you'll see this in your CS project. This is a .NET 8 thing that was added. And you may be asking, well, what does that MAUI version thing mean, right? Are you asking that? Yeah. And, and so that's actually a variable being read from the workload. So you've got .NET MAUI on your machine. It's part of .NET. It's on your machine. What version is it? Well, it's going to be read from that MAUI version. But what if you want this NuGet package? What needs to happen? It needs to be updated to a specific version. So MAUI version will be whatever the latest version of .NET is on your machine. And then the explicit version is the package that you updated to from NuGet. So if ever you try to package from NuGet and you're like, ah, that was worse, I got to go back, then you just change that back to Maui version and you're back on the latest stable release. Does it make sense? Cool. Maui version is read from the install workload. You can override this actually in your CS project at the very top by saying Maui version uh, in the very first block. And then installing the NuGet package will update the reference, but not the MAUI version. So be careful. We're going to work on our Visual Studio Package Manager scenario to try to get you uh, so that you're not in a bad space if you use MAUI version, but you also use the package reference. All right. What else is new? Well, part of .NET 8, and you hopefully are probably already using this, is the new Visual Studio Code extension. Um, so this is uh, both to help with the Visual Studio for Mac going away, but also it's something we've all wanted for a very long time. One editor that looks and behaves the same on all the platforms that we work on, and that does include Linux. So it's wonderful to now have Visual Studio Code support. It is in preview right now. Things like uh, Hot Reload for XAML and for C Sharp will be coming. Um, I heard rumors I might be able to hack my way into it, uh, and so I'll be super excited if I can do that, but that will be uh, awesome. You can already debug, deploy, you can pick your targets, you know, if you want a certain Android emulator or device. You can also use tunneling if your device is on some other machine and that sort of thing. So um, there are scenarios where you could use that across DevBox and some of the cloud-based solutions if that's interesting. So we're really excited about this, and we're, we're actively working on it, and it will continue to improve every week, 
I have noticed even just this morning that I got an update in my extension. Uh, Maddie showed off the .NET Upgrade Assistant this morning. So this is something we continue to improve upon. We just recently added this multi-project support. Um, we are adding UWP to WinUI support. Um, we are also trying to make it really good at going from .NET 7 to .NET 8 and in the future .NET 9, et cetera. So this is a tool that you'll want to be familiar with. Um, it's super convenient. Um, However, I will say that the transition for MAUI from .NET 7 to .NET 8 is so easy that I almost didn't have enough words to write a wiki about it. You just change the 7 to an 8, and you laugh. That's all you got to do. Should I have made it harder? Was that too easy? All right. Um, yeah, that's all you got to do. So the tool will also help with some things. If we find that there are other things we need to do, we will. There are no breaking changes going from 7 to 8 in terms of MAUI. Uh, we try to keep things as calm as possible uh, during this phase. But that doesn't mean that you will not be getting great things in .NET 8. .NET 8, we only backported 20% of the bug fixes to .NET 7. Why only 20%? Well. Every time you have to validate a release and validate a build, that's time, that's effort. It slows everything down, slows all the engineering team down. And so we had to narrow our focus on a release, and that was .NET 8. So that meant that, yes, critical things made it back to service releases for .NET 7. But if you have been considering, should I be trying .NET 8? How quickly should I adopt .NET 8 for MAUI? Do it immediately. There are so many more bug fixes there. Uh, you will be banging your head on .NET 7 by comparison. So I highly recommend that. But more than bug fixes, we actually have some other stuff in here. Uh, I mentioned the multi-headed applications. So just like your Xamarin Forms projects were set up, you can do the same thing with .NET MAUI. Um, there are perhaps a few benefits, uh, narrowing or focusing your build times to a particular platform in some scenarios where a multi-targeted will build everything but we've tried to really solve that, so that shouldn't be much of a problem. I prefer single project. Single project puts everything where you want it to be. You don't have to worry about the multiple projects. You manage your nougats in one place. Oh, I hate managing versions of nougats across multiple projects. Anybody else hate that? All right, thank you very much. It's not just me. Um, so single project has a lot of value in that. But multi-head, you can use that if you want to. There's a GitHub link at the bottom of the screen here where Matthew hosts that, and we will be getting that up onto NuGet soon. Migration compatibility. I mentioned that we've been doing a lot of bug fixing. Well, for a long time, we actually did not have all of the Xamarin Forms unit tests, or, or UI tests in particular, running against Maui because we couldn't. Um, if you were a Xamarin UI test user, you kind of understand that pain because for a long time it did not support .NET. So with the, with the latest releases and the work we've done, we've been able to get those tests now up onto .NET 8, and we've been able to validate our releases against them. So that's a huge relief because it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of UI tests, right? And we were able to see, okay, is are we getting the same positive results on MAUI that we are in forms? We know there are differences. Some of those differences are intentional. But those that aren't, we want to make sure that we've got that. So that's a huge difference between what you've seen in the Net 7 and the Net 8 release. The Net 8 release has got a lot more coverage. Um, they're all passing on .NET 8. That's very cool. Um, all that red stuff is all good now in the uh, screenshot. Memory leaks. Who loves a good memory leak, yeah? Ah, uh, that'll take a couple days off your life. So Mr. Jonathan Peppers from our Android team has gone in and done a lot of work on memory leaks. He has written a whole wiki, very detailed on how to troubleshoot memory leaks in your application, how to identify if it is a real leak, why is that happening. He has written Roslyn analyzers that we now use to find things like circular references that cause memory leaks. And we've been able to plug dozens of them in our code. So that's super wonderful. What you're actually seeing on the screen, if you can catch the numbers quickly enough, on one side, you've got a WinUI app. On the other side, you've got a Mac app. The WinUI app wasn't leaking too badly, but the Mac Catalyst app was leaking pretty hard. 
Um, and so the nice thing about Mac Catalyst is, for the most part, anything you can do in Catalyst is going to benefit your iOS because it's all the same UI stack, all the same rendering, um, because it's the same. That's what Catalyst is all about. So a lot better on the uh, uh, memory management. Memory leaks hopefully are uh, fewer and farther between. We have also added keyboard accelerators. So if you are, who, who's doing desktop development at all? At all, okay. And of you, who would raise your hand and say, we want to use Maui for it, or we are using Maui for it? All right, okay, you're kind of, eh, yeah. Uh, so desktop in general is relatively new as far as, you know, Xamarin had UWP, but it really was more focused on mobile scenarios, um, really didn't take seriously the desktop scenarios like, you know, we need to be able to have performant data grids or certain drag and drop scenarios, certainly not keyboard accelerators. So um, now you can have a keyboard accelerator. What is a keyboard accelerator? I, I hate, I honestly hate the name but it's the name that was chosen by some desktop platforms, so we use it. Um, this essentially is your shortcut, right? So control F on that, you hit your keyboard and you're gonna trigger the same thing as if you had clicked that menu item. Now keyboard accelerators, of course, uh, are pretty much all tied to menu items. So if you wanna do keyboard capture without menu items, you can go find my plugin where I give you a, a way for you to listen to all the keyboard events so that you can just have a, you know, a password logger or whatever. No, I'm just kidding. You can't do that. It's not allowed. Um, so lots of good work here to enable more keyboard scenarios with regards to shortcuts. Other keyboard improvements, and I love this one. So have you ever had a form on your phone and you clicked into a box and the keyboard covered the box you were supposed to be typing in? Yeah, all the time? Happens on Android all the time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, so this is something that we've done a lot of great work on. Um, what you're seeing here is a Xamarin Forms app, a MAUI app, and the new MAUI improved app. Uh, it's using editors, it's using all kinds of input fields, and if you kind of follow what's happening here, it stays in view when the keyboard pops up. We've also added new keyboard APIs, or we have keyboard APIs for uh, explicitly showing and hiding keyboard. So you have more control over all of that stuff. So very cool. Drag and drop. So this tends to be pretty important for a lot of applications. And is that video gonna play? Do I have to click it again? Clicked it again. So there you go. So you can drag and drop, you can add custom glyphs. So what that means is when you're dragging, you can have a special icon. Um, that icon might indicate the kind of thing that it is, or it might indicate when you can drop it or can't drop it. That's a very common scenario. You know, a big red X if you're over the wrong thing, but a green check mark when you're over the right thing. Um, or wacky stuff, like uh, a copy icon for no particular reason. Um, so lots of drag and drop stuff that you can do there, and it also works on iOS and Android. If the video plays, there the video is playing. So you can see dragging and dropping there as well. So very cool. Anybody interested in these demos? Is this cool stuff? Is this all right? I love it. Uh, so yeah, new drag and drop. This particular enhancement here was for the iOS to support those specific APIs. All right, pointer gestures. So sometimes you need to know, am I hovering it? Am I pressing it? Am I pressing down? Have I released it? All those sorts of things are important when you're doing uh, pointer-related things. Well, we had the ability to do a lot of that stuff with your finger, but not the pointer, and it was different. So with uh, this release, we have improved the pointer press, pointer release gestures. So now you can take advantage of those in your application. It's almost like it's a real desktop app. It's lovely. Um, iOS large images fixed. This one was one that drove me nuts. Uh, when I was moving applications from Xamarin Forms to Maui, and I would have an image that suddenly was not the right size. It's like, what happened? How did that happen? Why did it happen? Um, and it's very hard for me as a developer to really be able to overcome that unless I know what's happening. Um, so it turns out what you could have done is guessed at the size that image should have been and said that. 
but if you've got an iPhone, an iPhone Pro, an iPhone Pro Max, and you've got an iPad, and then you've got an Android, Note Pixel, Hitachi, uh, Huawei, uh, what other phones are there out there? Sony, you know, all these different screen sizes, that's not gonna fly. So it turns out there was a limitation on the way native iOS was downsizing images to fit the space and how it was handling scaling. So that is now fixed. It will be in the next service release of .NET MAUI, and I'm very excited about it because I hacked my way around that one for way too long. Uh, iOS safe area fixes are coming. So I don't know about your applications, but I have several applications where I don't want the navigation bar to cover my content. I want it to be transparent, and I want to be able to scroll all the way to the top of the screen. Uh, there's a lot of applications out there like this, but I still want to have my uh, flyout. So in uh, .NET 8GA, hopefully this will all be fixed and we can all celebrate this. Um, there's actually a way for you to implement this yourself. So there, that's one of the great things about MAUI, is that the architecture actually makes it easier for you to override the behavior of MAUI. Whereas Xamarin Forms, it was way harder. In Xamarin Forms, you had to basically take over control of a whole bunch of stuff. In Maui, you can hack in just to a certain property or to an event, or in this case, uh, a transparent appearance class. And you can just override that thing and do what you want it to do. So, very cool. Um, also, several improvements in general to the use safe area. Uh, so in my case, I want to use safe area false and I want to ignore safe area true on any layout. And I don't know if you've seen this property. It was actually something I didn't notice when we first shipped Maui. It may have been there in the first release, but on any layout inside of your page, if you want it to ignore the safe la area layout, but have other stuff behave properly, then you can do that by setting this property. Um, and if you're unaware, what is the safe area on iOS? It's that space at the very top. And if you turn it to the side, it protects things like that dynamic island and the, the former notch and things like that so that content doesn't accidentally overlap or underlap that stuff. WSA, Windows Subsystem for Android. Is anybody using Windows Subsystem for Android? Is it available in Bulgaria? Do we even know this? Okay, well, maybe not everybody's here from Bulgaria. Um, so what this is, is there's actually a whole Android subsystem that you can install and run on Windows, and you can target it with your Visual Studio to use uh, that as your emulator, essentially. And so it's faster than booting up emulators, it's easier than configuring emulators, um, and you can treat it like a desktop app because essentially it's unbounded in terms of size. So if you're dealing with, hey, I need to make sure I handle multiple screen sizes with my Android app, you don't have to manage multiple emulators, you can just resize that window to represent the different screen sizes that you care about. Um, so in order to get started with Windows Subsystem for Android, you can Google it in our Learn documentation. Um, and then once you have it enabled and you've got the latest build of Visual Studio, you'll be able to see it as a device target on your machine. All right, what else is happening? There is quite a bit more happening. iOS 17 and Xcode 15 work. Um, so I believe iOS 17 was part of the Monday or the Tuesday release this week. Um, yeah. The, so, and by that I mean the actual SDK APIs that are new to iOS 17. For several releases, we've had the ability for you to use Xcode 15, which is the latest release from Apple. In .NET 8, we've also enabled and will be completing APIs for Android 34, API 34. Um, and WinApp SDK, I just heard 1.4.2, 1.4.2 is going to be our release version. Um, so that's brand, that's hot bits coming from the Windows team. Um, I don't think we've even used it yet. But it resolves something that was wrong with the previous version, so that's awesome. Um, I don't know what other features Windows has uh, put into it, but it's all good news. Um, we have removed the Rosetta dependency. So Rosetta is an emulation software on ARM chips from Apple that allows you to run Intel architecture uh, code, right? And so that's great, but it also means that your apps are slower, it takes up a bunch of hard, hard drive space. Um, now that's gone. So not only are your MAUI apps able to run unvirtualized, which is smoking fast. Um, one customer, 
One customer that I was talking to showed me their extremely large, complicated desktop application running on Windows and then running on the Mac M1. The M1 started in like under a second. It was crazy fast. Um, and then the Windows one, not so much. But that was really, really cool. In part because they also have a AOT, ahead of time compilation for the Mac applications. So that combined with no Rosetta dependency, super fast. And then, this is something that I heard about recently, which I would have been not excited about until I saw the numbers, but this Android Resources Designer. You've probably seen this file. It gets auto-generated in your projects, and you're like, what is this thing? Do I really need it? Why is it barking at me? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and so what this is, is it's basically a large file that indexes all the resources needed for your Android application, your layout IDs, your uh, images, uh, your strings, all your styles, et cetera. Um, and it uses that for your application, but it doesn't actually need it in every single assembly, and it doesn't actually need it uh, in, in the runtime build that we generate. And so we went and we, re we just fixed all that, right? We optimized the heck out of it, and that was able to get us an 8% assembly size reduction uh, and 2% app package size reduction, packaging being the actual resulting application. And then 8% faster startup. That's probably a best case scenario. You may not see immediately an 8% just because you upgrade to .NET 8, but you ought to see some benefit from this. Um, and in general, all of our benchmarks show that .NET 8 MAUI, .NET 8 Android, iOS, all the flavors of applications you can build um, are at least as fast, if not slightly faster than .NET 7 which is awesome considering that wasn't really a priority of work for us during that time period. Um, so we made sure that we didn't regress in that space and I'm really thankful for that. Um, hopefully in the next release we can put a little more focus there because we certainly have some, some areas to improve. All right, I have 22 minutes. Let's talk a little bit about what's coming in .NET 9. So all that stuff you can access today. Uh, it's release candidate 2.1 right now. You'll be able to get GA on November 14th. And we are already talking about what we can do in .NET 9. What is it that is going to help customers the most? What's the most valuable thing that we can do? So by far, the top thing that we are actively working on right now in planning stages is Swift Interop. So if you aren't aware, there's about 213 iOS frameworks. 122 of those are Objective-C, pure Objective-C, nothing else to it. There are 58 that are both Objective-C and Swift, so they're covered by both. In some of those scenarios, new features to those frameworks only happen in the Swift one, not the Objective-C one. So if you're on Swift, you start to get an advantage, right? And then more and more, 33 now, of those frameworks are Swift only. And this is just a sampling on the side of the screen as to what those are. That's obviously not 33, but those are the ones that I think are among the most recognizable. And so <clears throat> Swift only things we have really no answer for in C Sharp at this point that we're shipping to you. So you effectively from a C Sharp standpoint can't make a widget because it's Swift only, right? So how would you do that today? Well, today you could write it in Swift and then you can bundle it together with build steps and ship it with your .NET application. So you can build the application in .NET and build the widget in Swift and ship it together. That's, that's doable. It's a pain. It's a little wonky. You kind of have to go deep into the plumbing to make it happen, but you can do that. With this, the hope is, is that we're going to be able to cover enough scenarios that we're going to be able to start enabling some of these frameworks and some of the Swift-only experiences. So if you want to see how that work is going, what we think we're going to be able to accomplish during this period of time, that's the GitHub open repository of design documents. You'll be able to see a whole discussion there as the plan evolves. Um, the one thing I would say is it's still early days. I'm not promising that we're going to solve everything Swift. Certainly Swift UI is a whole other thing for us to consider once we get this foundation laid. Um, but it's super great news that we're doing work in this space and it's gonna be a nice improvement 
for your applications. And it's going to mean that you're going to be able to keep .NET relevant on Apple platforms for much longer. Because the trend certainly is to phase out the Objective-C and to turn more things over to Swift. So we want to make sure that we can help you use the latest things that they're shipping, and all the new stuff is Swift. Cool? All right, other goals that we have, and we'll figure out how many of these things that we will be able to plan for and accomplish in .NET 9. We want to continue to look at how we can increase the velocity of our bug fixing. We've been having conversations about it. You know, should we put more process in, less process? Do we need to dedicate Gerald 24-7, tell him he can't sleep at night? He can only solve, you, you can't go to bed until you get your 10th bug, Gerald, close. Um, so we're, we're certainly talking about and looking at all of those things. And it's encouraging to me as I look at other open source projects and some of their roadmaps, and they're all talking very similarly. It's like, oh, let's see what we can do about increasing the velocity of our work, you know? Um, and some of that might be uh, making it easier for contributors to come in and help out. But that honestly does require a lot of effort on the core team's part uh, because you have to review things, you have to bring it up to standards. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth. So uh, reducing build times. I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, build times could be better. So there are times when my Android app builds in 15 seconds. And there are times when my Android app builds in uh, what it takes to, to make a cup of Americano after grinding beans, making the hot water boil, getting it into my cup, and then drinking it, and then coming back to my seat. So that's not cool. I want the 15 seconds or even faster. So um, we, again, this was another area that we really didn't focus on in this past period of time. And so it would be good for us to spend some more time investing in it. Some of these areas are just those areas that there are always going to be things that are on the list. When do you spend time investing in it? When is it at the height that you need to work on it, right? Improving runtime performance always would be wonderful. I would love to see much more fluid and responsive applications. Um, support for native desktop experiences. And, and I will back up. In terms of like runtime performance and things like that, um, it's not that nothing happened in .NET 8 as relates to that. It just wasn't a major focus. So they were more opportunistic fixes. Like we introduced something called setter, specific setter specificity. What that generally, what that effort was all about was to help hot reload be accurate when it was applying properties through setters to controls. Um, and so, we wanted to improve hot reload experience, but that also meant that things got much stricter. And that actually means that your app gets slower. <laughs> when you have more if statements and you're doing more validations and more null reference checks, your app gets slower. Did you know that? Everybody knew that, right? No? No, you disagree? No, it's true. It's totally true. Um, so anyway, we were able to then go back identify why it had gotten slower, change the way something had been implemented, and we gained back all that time. So um, support for native desktop experiences. There's still more that we can do in terms of desktop, uh, especially around cursors, keyboard. Um, I think accessibility is in a really good place. We actually just went through our .NET 8 accessibility review, passed it with flying colors. Everybody's like, accessibility, that's so boring. Yes, but it's important. Um, improving hot reload is going to continue to be something we hear back. In our feedback, we definitely hear hot reload's not good enough, it's not reliable, it fails on me, it only works sometimes, blah, blah, blah. And so we definitely want to continue to push on that and do everything we can to, uh, to make it reliable. Um, I'm, as I mentioned, super excited that we're going to get that going in VS Code. Um, and then adding documentation and samples is probably the other thing that we get in our survey feedback and from talking to developers. I want more documentation. Well, what documentation do you want? And then they go silent. So if you have documentation you want, if you, want, if you have a sample, you're like, I want to see code do this because I don't understand it or because I'm missing it and it's taking me too long to figure it out by hacking around it, let us know. Please let us know. Um, send us a, an email anytime. Uh, because that would be super helpful. 
Can't promise you that I'll, I'll have it written for you, but it will be considered. Um, a quick note about releases. So .NET 7, of course, shipped in November of last year. It is supported through essentially May of next year. We ship on the .NET schedule, so major releases every November, um, and always 18-month releases for .NET MAUI. So long-term service release means nothing to .NET MAUI. That's been something that's caused some confusion. Why is that? And Maddie showed this slide earlier, but it's because we have these dependencies on Apple and Google, and they give us new bits every year. And you know, Windows really is no different. They're giving us new bits all the time too. And so we need the flexibility to react to that, and in some cases, make big breaking changes. Hopefully not, but when Apple breaks something, and they often do, we need to be able to react to it. Um, and so in order to do that, 18 months is really the, the right timing. That's probably more generous if you are doing any kind of mobile thing or anything that depends on Apple or Google as the platform, then you want to be upgrading annually. You want to be on the latest stuff. And if you're in the Play Store or the Apple App Store, they're going to require it within an 18-month time period generally anyway. So, so that's why we're on that schedule. So .NET 9 will ship next year in November. Uh, yes, I said that. Oh, one thing I will also mention for those who have Xamarin apps. Who has a Xamarin app in the room? One shy person, two shy people. So your applications will receive Microsoft support uh, through May of 2024, but we also did, and Maddie, I didn't correct you when you were speaking, but we did, we did actually ship Xcode 15 support and Android API 34 support for Xamarin applications. And so that means that you can build with those and remain compliant with those stores. We may not give you every API that is new, but you can use the tooling, stay compliant, while you are moving those things to .NET MAUI, which of course is the best destination in the world, because it's MAUI and it's a beach and it's in Hawaii, and Hawaii is amazing. Yep, there's the end date for Xamarin. And with that, Go build amazing things with .NET 7, apparently. <laughs> uh, we have time for questions. We have 12 and a half minutes. All right, got one here. And if you need to leave, you can leave, go ahead. Hang on, she's bringing a microphone for the audience. Or for, not for the audience. Hello. The audience. Question. The video audience for later. What is the performance of the application compared uh, to the same application built with the native tools, Swift uh, and yeah. Apple SDK? Yeah. So, so the performance, uh, the runtime or the build performance? Sorry. The runtime. Runtime performance. Uh, yeah. So runtime performance, you are never going to get faster than using the native native stuff. So building something with Swift or Objective C, those apps are always going to run fastest. Um, I think that the startup time on a native iOS application is under 100 milliseconds. Um, that's before you put junk on the first screen. So whatever you do there is going to impact that. But uh, a final new application in Swift or Objective-C is going to be that fast. Android, um, I don't remember exactly. I want to say it was under 200 milliseconds. Um, so that's always going to be faster. So when you come and use something like .NET and .NET MAUI, you know, you're using it for different reasons. Like, our goal is to have acceptable startup times and, when possible, make it awesome. But the question that I would always ask when it comes to startup time concerns is, what's your goal? And why is it your goal? Like, I've had customers tell me, developers tell me, I don't care if it takes 20 seconds to load up because we only load it once a day and it runs forever. Now, does that mean that 20 seconds is my goal? Absolutely not. Um, so right now, our Android apps launch, uh, bareandroid.net launches at around four or 500 milliseconds. And check it out. John Peppers has a blog post that documents all this stuff that will be coming out with our GA release or sometime shortly before. So it will have numbers in it. If his numbers are slightly different than what I'm saying, you can trust his numbers. Um, a .NET MAUI application is currently under 700 milliseconds for a... Um, for like a, a, a real app. Our podcast app is one that we 
profile, which has web views in it, has tons of controls, has media elements, and things like that. So, you know, an Android application launching in 700 milliseconds, I, I think that's satisfactory. But if you disagree, but would it be faster with uh, with Java or Kotlin? Yeah, absolutely, because it doesn't have to start the .NET runtime. So yeah, but then you don't get to use the .NET runtime. And you don't get to use all of our awesome APIs to do cross-platform things. Other questions? Okay. Will, you, will you say it in the mic so that we can? Sorry. How about during uh, usage of the application after startup? Is there is a performance difference then? Right, right. Well, assuming that you haven't introduced a bunch of circular references with memory leaks. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so there's definitely a benefit to using native native for, for runtime performance, screen to screen transitions, animations, and things like that. Um, you're going to pay some penalty for the cross platform .NET layout stuff that we do. Um, I don't know numbers wise what the difference is right now, but that is one of the reasons that it's on our list to look at in .NET 9, because now that we've got a bunch of controls actually doing what the control is supposed to do, Let's see what we can't do to improve the whole experience overall. So um, it's, not as, it's not as fast as we want it to be. Um, but it, you know, hey, we have room for improvement. <laughs> Anybody else? Any questions? Raise Please it high. Ask questions. I'm very blind. Ask about my granddaughter. I'll answer questions about my granddaughter. Mm -hmm. How old is your granddaughter? How old? She is one plus three months. Aww. Yeah, 15 <laughs> months. She's adorable. She runs. She's now playing with the dogs. Yeah, go ahead. Is there a risk of glitches? And, uh, is that bad, the performance, actually? Is it uh, much worse than the native tools, actually? Right. When so, I, for example, scroll, yeah. can I see glitches? Yeah. yeah, I mean, just about any application, you'll be able to make some glitches if you want um, in terms of scrolling. So uh, we have done quite a bit of work on our collection view and our scrolling um, in general in .NET 8 so that it is smoother to address some of those glitches. Most of that's, you know, that's measure and layout performance related stuff. Some of that was memory leak stuff that we had to address. Um, so yeah, again, you, by default, if you're doing everything properly, okay, you're going to be faster on native for almost every scenario. Um, and in both cases, you can do things improperly that will make it glitchy. Um, I will say that one of the things that we did with .NET MAUI and with our, uh, the shell that we kind of host most of our stuff in is we looked very closely at the Android overdraw to make sure that we were getting the best performance we could from that. Um, and we were able to reduce that to basically nothing. So um, you shouldn't be getting glitch if you're, if you're doing well. Um, if you're getting a lot of glitch, that's not acceptable, and we should fix it. Oh, we've got two. Thank you. Um, I don't have a question, but uh, more like I would like to share something with you that most probably would be interesting. It is related to list view, probably collection view. Uh, when you select a given item, for instance, uh, there is always, uh, let's call it something like selected item color, which on Android by default is orange. Mm. And uh, I was trying to figure out a way how to change exactly this color, but I had some problem with it. However, I found uh, a workaround of this problem. For instance, I was not using the item tapped event mm. of uh, the list view collection but uh, I was relying on my MVVM pattern and I used a special dedicated command for this purpose and uh, used the gesture recognizers uh, which are available for these types of collections. So this actually solved the problem with uh, the selected item color. If any of you has ever encountered it, probably this approach would be suitable for you. Thank you. Yeah, so that orange color is the accent color that comes from the Android resources. And it's annoyingly not something you can customize from the cross-platform layer. Um, you might also look at Visual State Manager for that scenario.
to be able to set what you want the background color to be. Yeah, next. Was it you? Thank you. Okay, so you told us about compared to the native platforms like Swift and Kotlin, but how about these real competitors like Footer or um, <laughs> uh, native JS? Yeah. Is so it better? And if yes, why? Yeah. Uh, except we could use your awesome .NET APIs. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Flutter is faster and React Native is faster. Um, the two main reasons being is they don't give you all the native APIs. And so they just poke holes into the native SDKs and you end up doing message passing and things like that to be able to use the platform specific things. Um, Flutter, of course, is basically a game engine. And so it's doing uh, repetitive frames and it's drawing everything. And so it's highly optimized for that. So it's more like Unity 3D and it's going to be faster. Um, and it can start up very quickly because it's not starting up very much. Um, React Native is more similar to .NET MAUI in the way it's architected for native things. However, it's also passing all the instructions for native commands through a JavaScript bridge, right? Um, and so you are not directly exercising native things, you are passing it off to the native uh, platform. So in part, really the, the slowness that we see um, is comparable, or the speed that we see is comparable. So a Flutter real world application will start in about 400, 450 milliseconds, uh, maybe 200 if you get a really good Android device. And I'm speaking mostly Android terms on these numbers because that's where all the problems are. People <laughs> very rarely say, this app doesn't load up quickly on iOS. Like it just almost never happens. Um, and if it does, it's almost never our fault because we're, we're almost at parity with iOS. Um, and then again, so you know, four, four, 450 milliseconds versus 700 milliseconds, like is that the end of the world? Um, you know, is your customer going to come to you and complain that the app loaded in just under a second as opposed to just under half a second. Um, so, and the reason why it's slower to load is because it has to load up mono and it has to load up the .NET runtime at the beginning. Um, and those things take time. It takes, takes a whole 500 milliseconds or something. <laughs> so, which, which isn't to say that that's not something we want to improve. That is absolutely something we want to improve. I would love to people to be saying, why isn't Flutter as fast as .NET MAUI? Like that's, that would be amazing. Does that matter to most of our customers? Absolutely not. They don't care. It's a vanity metric in many cases, unfortunately. Everybody put your hands together. Give them a whoop. Amazing. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. It's been an amazing conference and I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for our, to our sponsors and thank you to SEC for hosting us. We appreciate you all, and I just hope you all have a wonderful and safe evening. So thank you. Bye, everybody.